usually there's a clear subject matter <laughs> to just like start with and you know if i'm sitting down with somebody that has had a project or if we're going into some particular aspect of something they've you know spent a lot of their time focusing on in life or if it's something to do with me then uh i would just kind of sort of know what to do already but this is just winging it right right are you trying to say that uh there's nothing really noteworthy to talk about with me that you're just like hey come on in (laughs) I don't know. What are we going to talk about with you? Uh... <laughs> I mean, it, it's there's a lot that's already been said. <laughs> yeah. You know, we've had uh, quite a few minutes slash years <laughs> to figure out uh, 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 each other. So I think I kind of know stuff. And I also have to think about like what is worth like re-asking in a way right yeah i didn't think about that that's true right because there's stuff that's just taken for granted uh, slash stuff that is like oh yeah that's just a a, a detail but like you don't really we don't know what the public doesn't know in a way well there's that i mean i know what they don't know but i just but but i mean yeah you don't you don't you don't think about it from an an, an, exactly with fresh eyes exactly so there's that uh hi by the way hi Thanks for sitting down with me, Punch Mom. And uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, I traveled a long distance to be here. Certainly, all the way from over there to <laughs> over here. And uh, also, thanks for like you know being down to do these. That's of course. that's cool. I actually really wanted to start doing these like more often because you know um, I think I think like this type of thing needs momentum mm. right a, po- a, a podcast needs to sort of have a regular sort of you know um schedule you want to stick to in yeah. some way or at the very least window like you can drop them whenever admittedly mm-hmm. it is better if you have something that you kind of do on a more frequent basis you know but- what's interesting that's supported by science too well at least for writing what's up in studies if you get someone to write every day on like whatever mm-hmm. uh you're going to be more productive and like produce better content than if you just wait for inspiration. And I feel like so far this podcast has been more like inspiration based. Yeah. It's reactionary to things that happen. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's, that act- that's actually something we've talked about too, where it's like, you're going to make bad things. So just get them out of the way. <laughs> and then eventually good things will come once you've, you know, like done yeah. it many, many times. So totally. Uh, that is, that's pretty par for the course, but I suppose the um, the idea here as well is that like not it, like inspiration based is one way of putting it. Other like like other ways of of putting it would be like when shit goes wrong, <laughs> 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 waiting for fuck ups and bad things to happen. Hey, beauty comes out of crisis. It certainly does. It can. Uh, beauty in the breakdown. Yeah, there you go. Right, <laughs> but uh, no, there's there's a um, benefit as well that is besides just like the the. the the recording of the audio itself on a regular basis. That is, I think I mentioned perhaps in earlier episodes, like using this as a means of talking thoughts out loud and uh, the benefits of talking thoughts out loud Mm -hmm. because I don't talk to myself. Yeah. And I always find it. I've always found it weird. Mm -hmm. Uh, My mom used to talk to herself I talk to myself. You talk to yourself all the time. (laughs) I didn't notice until we moved in together because I lived alone for like five years before we moved in. Yeah. And I didn't know how much I sang to myself, hummed, talked. Well, you know what? How about that? Let's start there. What the fuck is the deal with talking to yourself? Me, specifically? What's up with it? Because there's there's a lot of thoughts. Okay, you know how in real life, I start a, a thought and then I'll jump and then I'll go backwards. Okay, wait, let me frame the context. Did it, that goes on in my brain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that goes, on, that, goes, that goes on in my brain as well. So talking it out loud helps me focus mm-hmm. on like the task at hand or whatever I'm doing. 
Okay. It's almost like even writing a to-do list. Like when I get anxious about schoolwork or, or whatever the case is, I re-remember shit and I get re-anxious over things. Yeah. But if you just write it down, oh, there it is. You already accounted for it. Yes, exactly. Writing out loud, that's kind of the same thing for me. Yeah. Okay. I mean, writing things down uh, definitely is like, yeah, you don't have to remember it because it's on paper. That's sort mm-hmm. of the part of the, the, the deal there. Talking out loud, I guess... Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I've just been too self-conscious with it, mm. but it's just like, it's just never really occurred to me as a thing, especially when, um, especially when I'm like not really working through a process as much as it is just like, if you're trying to remember a list of things, I get it. That's just yeah. a, that's a human thing. Uh, I think the times that talking out loud has come into like the forefront has most <laughs> frequently has been uh, most recently I should say has been when recording things mm. on camera right because th- I in my um in my obsessions with trying to be understood yeah or at the very least leaving enough of a clear impression that you can piece together what I was going for mm-hmm. sometimes there's times when under, when I, uh, I I I would see people confused as to like what I was trying to do at a given moment Mm -hmm. or like why I kept failing at something Mm -hmm. or why I was something wasn't working out in in an LP. So I've taken to having a habit of describing my process as I'm doing it so that when it meets failure, whoever knows why I failed (laughs) can see, okay, the step you missed was the fourth thing. Mm -hmm, Right. mm -hmm. So it, it was not, a natural thing for me to start just like talking out in those moments mm-hmm. but it was like when i'm okay I'm, I'm recording something and i've tried to make this jump uh five times and it didn't work okay so the sixth time here's what i'm gonna do i'm holding the run button i'm running towards the cliff and i'm gonna press it now and then it's it missed mm-hmm. right so it missed like the other times before now there's something i don't know about this what is it you know what i mean and, and that that type of yeah talking out loud uh that that's what i've kind of picked up on you has know? it helped you in any way outside of ah, the i goal? don't know if it does have any effect it would have effect on perhaps somebody that doesn't understand what mistake if someone goes like what is wrong with him right yeah right perhaps it has told that person what is wrong with me and stopped them from remarking that uh, or having that thought because now they can see exactly what the problem was or like you know why would you assume this and i think uh, it was interesting in uh, Baba Is You. Oh, yeah. Do you remember that? Right. Well, I remember sitting in the front and hearing you talking crazy. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I yeah, had yeah, no yeah, 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 yeah. It was so that was a really funny one because in that case, it was actually like you have to unmake your assumptions, mm. right? And I had to like literally talk through mm. what I had made an assumption <laughs> on mm-hmm. the rules of the world of the game and everything. And find where the assumption was wrong. If right? you played alone, would you have talked out loud? Do you think for that game? I mean, I, 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 I did play alone. No, I mean not in not streaming. If you weren't talking for the audience, yeah. If you were just by yourself, would you have talked that out? No, I'd probably just <laughs> mumble. A little, maybe okay. I might mumble a little bit, like, mm, mm-hmm. da, 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 you know what I mean? Yeah. But like, like I would do things like that. But like, yeah, definitely, I haven't used out loud talking as a means of organizing my thoughts, okay. like off camera. Well, I I've, I was asking a couple of those questions to see, did this help you in any way? Because you said, maybe I don't talk out loud because I'm self-conscious. But it doesn't sound like it's giving you benefits. Not directly. it's really for other people. It's for other people. So now I'm wondering, is it taking away from your ability to do stuff? Like, are you devoting energy now to talk out loud? This thing that you are that we can see now is not a natural thing for you to do. And are, as you're playing, do you think you play less well because you have to now do this thing that's not natural and well, that's, out loud? Well, that's 100%. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's that? true. That's what LPing is. <laughs> you, 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 you know, you've heard, I've, heard, I've used the term LP tax around you, yeah, right? Yeah. Like you are definitely not doing the same things that you would be doing slash you're, you're just, you are not focusing as much as you should on mm-hmm. just the game because you're too aware of the microphone. And you're you're too aware of like, you know, like everything. Yeah. yeah outside yeah. of just the game and enjoying it in its rawest form. Yeah. And like, yeah, we, we you, you you know, so there, there's always going to yeah. be that. There's always going to be a little bit of that. Yeah, it's funny because actually the only time having an audience helps is if you're really, really fucking good at something. Like when you do studies, yeah. if you're an expert, it gives you that old boost because you want to, I don't know, now I'm 
picturing why, but I guess because he wanted to show off or it just gives you like that energy and you can use that productively. But like in every other scenario, it just makes you worse. Yeah. So you were telling me about this and yeah. disclaimer, this is coming from my bachelor, <coughs> which I graduated in 2013. And I've realized by listening to some podcasts, I did it in psych, uh, listening to some podcasts, my stuff is already out of date. So this is time locked <laughs> information. And I'm sure it's different now. But yeah, this is disclaimer. From, Punch yeah. Mom's really smart because she has a lot of uh, actual info on uh, many, I guess, psych and social issues you might want to say psychosocial psychosocial issue there you go yeah i don't and know if that's a term in english but in french it's like yeah. psychosocial intervention no 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 uh, totally yeah, okay. totally works and uh i think in the context of a podcast where we're going into yeah you know creative endeavors mental health couple other things on a regular basis i think your input is more than valuable <laughs> in this context considering how many times you have a piece of data that you bring to the table that i was like wait what <laughs> there's a name for that right right there's an effect that is a, that, that 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 dictates that the more you perform in front of people <laughs> like your experience levels will have a massive uh, 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 boost or dim or they diminish the opposite way well anyway i'll let yeah. you break it down yeah, no, well, it is nice to have that knowledge because I don't know about you, but it makes me feel like less alone in a way. Like when you're going through something, you're like, wait, there's a word for that. If there's a word for that. Someone thought of this. That means I'm not the only one to have gone through this. And wait, if they publish that term, that means this is probably peer reviewed. That means a bunch of other people agree that this is real and like you can learn from it. There's like right now I'm reading a book about um, for my internship about codependency. And I just thought it was one thing. But now reading about it, because a bunch of people did research on it, it's like, wait, there's like all these different profiles. And it just now I have like a better understanding of this thing. And thus you have like better understanding of yourself. And there's a million individual little stories or or let's be real, like probably hundreds. Yeah. If we're talking about like a given paper, you know, mm -hmm. maybe even dozens. But there are still individual stories that are echoing things that you're going through and you can kind of go like, oh, OK, yeah. There's data on this. Yeah. And I can use that to figure out what mm -hmm. I'm actually looking at here. So what was the term for it again? For what? The term for um, uh, performance in front of an audience. Oh, that I don't remember. Okay. Yeah. Because there, I remember there was a, like there was an actual like label that uh, you introduced it with. That was, but, but, and effectively it was like, yeah, this is the, you can go look up the Wikipedia article on it. Right. Oh yeah. I remember right? when we first talked about this. It's been a while though. Yeah. I probably still have the textbook if you're that motivated, I can find it. But, uh. Well, I, I mean, just for the purposes of this discussion in right. the moment. Yeah. I don't remember anymore. Okay. But most, most phenomenal, you have to give it a word just to make it easier to research. Yeah. So I'm sure there's a word to and, describe and, that. Right. And so in this case, it's specifically, um. If you have, are doing something unpracticed, uh, you will perform worse in front of an audience mm -hmm. unpracticed, mm -hmm. right? Or experiencing something for the first time. Mm -hmm. But if you've done it already, and if you are practiced or experienced, you will perform better in front yeah. of an audience. Well, when you're when you really uh, have an expertise on the thing. Okay. Let's say you're a juggler and you've juggled a million times and you feel really fucking confident. Yes. Then that'll give you a boost. If you've done it and you're practicing and you're pretty good at it, it'll still be more stressful to be in front of an audience. Mm -hmm. Sounds like tournaments. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel you play worse in front of an audience I versus think, at home? Oh, I, I think uh, I think playing... Yeah, playing and playing in a tournament where it's just a little bit higher stress, like you're trying to use that stress to push you forward in your performance. Yeah. But like most of the time it ends up being <laughs> a little bit of a, a, a it's like a, some weights on you, right. you know what I mean? Yeah. It's holding you down a little bit. And then in a context where you're on stream, where you know that there's, you know, thousands of people watching, like it's it's multiplied, it's amplified. Yeah. You know, it's, it's pretty... You, you definitely feel that side of it, you know, because you're just like, oh, God, let me not like there's a there's a thing where you're basically going like, OK, even if I don't win, I need to not embarrass myself. 
<laughs> yeah. There's two layers of this, right? Yeah. You can, there's winning and then there's not embarrassing yourself. And you're way more focused on not embarrassing yourself mm. in a streaming context. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that means make t not taking risks that you probably should have. Does that make you like less in the moment, you think? Uh, I, it makes you a little less spontaneous. Yeah. Yeah. And does that, the spontaneity like factor into playing? Yeah, absolutely. Some of the best players and the best moments have these things that are like spontaneous and fantastic. But, you know, when you break it down, they're actually not that spontaneous because they've mm -hmm. practiced those things a mm -hmm. ton of times. Mm -hmm. And I was talking shit with the other guys, uh, 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 you know, a few days ago, but like that saying of like success is what happens when uh, luck meets opportunity mm -hmm. or sorry, when preparation meets opportunity. Okay. Um it's like, yeah, like these super amazing moments that are like, oh, my God, he just randomly did this amazing <laughs> thing in this one second. It's like, well, no, he kept practicing to what to do yeah. if that opening arrived, yeah. not knowing if it would ever arrive. Right. 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 It's just like when I found out that freestyling is not completely 100% yeah. improvised. Yeah. I was so shook. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you, you know what, though? You can tell when it is. Yeah. Because if you're hearing like quote unquote freestyling like in the in a in the modern parlance and you're hearing people just kind of like spitting it off the dome and they're going into these rhymes and everything they do is you know been rehearsed nine times and mm. it's you know what I mean like it's got these things where like they have the 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 phrases or they have the endings of their sentences kind of pieced together right. and they have a sort of a, a, a they're pretty much adapting it for the flow of the beat mm. but if you hear people slowing it down to be like 70s, 80s style, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like sitting at home on a Sunday <laughs> trying to figure out what to eat. If I went to the I can't even. It's gone. <laughs> it's gone. But you know what I mean? But, you, but yeah, like, yeah, yeah. when they slow down, yeah. you can see the wheels are spinning. Yeah. And they're the wheels trying, are spinning. They're it, using that time to think. Yeah. 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 You know, uh, um, it is it is a very distinct and different style. I think you should have a different name. Yeah. You I know, think that's fair. I think you should Just actually have skills. a different na name because, yeah, it's like you are actually improvising in that moment. Mm. Um, and then there's people that have like full verses pre-written that are stored up in their head Damn. for the moment that they're asked to freestyle. That feels wrong. Yeah. That's just performing it's like just a song perfor yeah. at that point. But you're, you, you've, you've put you've put like five freestyles in the can, yeah. And you're in a you're in a place where you know people might ask it of you, and then you know how to how to whip it out, yeah. You know, especially if it's like like dis dis tracks, like you're mm. roasting people mm. and stuff, yeah, yeah. You know, but yeah, there's 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 definitely a, a lack of spontaneity in some of that. Um, but yeah, no. So I guess the the. Uh, the 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 recent the the recent uh, uh, restructuring of moving things around on the channel and whatnot oh, yeah. mm -hmm. allowed me to sort of make a bit of space to record this more often mm -hmm. and um, you know I want to kind of I want to have a I want to have a, a a regular release schedule I don't I I want to say weekly but then what if I what if I fuck that up <laughs> what if what if I fuck what that if, up oh no you know I don't know. I'll figure it out <laughs> yeah yeah we'll figure it out. Well, uh, listen, I mean, this is still pretty new in terms of me joining in. So I'm sure we can just see how this uh, evolves. And it, then you can I'll announce a thing once we find like a, a rhythm that works. It should not be too hard for you and I to sit down and talk for an hour. At I don't some know. Point we don't hang out that much, though. It's going to be hard to. Well, now it's your other. fucking school and shit. No. <laughs> Legit. It's kind of fucking. <laughs> it's a bit inconvenient. You know. Just a little bit. It's only three years of my life right now. I'm back in school. So I did my bachelor's in psych and now I'm back to do my master's in social work. <sighs> so Eventually. Yay. Eventually. Um, it's fine. We'll take what we can get. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I don't know. How have uh, how have things been as of late? I suppose. I guess the, <laughs> I guess the like it's it's a rhetor it's not a rhetorical question, mm -hmm. but is it is a it is a question I ask the air, I right. ask you and the air at the same time because I know for me like uh, there has been some recent super not great things. No, uh, perhaps a little bit too new to go into. Okay, so uh, it's. 
it's on the nerve and you know eventually there'll probably come a point in which i will you know um talk a bit more about my perspective on mm-hmm. how uh i feel in these moments because that's all i can really do is just go talk about myself and what you know i think um my body's doing mm-hmm. but um one thing that's pretty uh remarkable and i i you know hope that i let you know this enough is you're super good at like uh helping people in moments of anxiety and at like just working through what's going on mm. and i don't know how much of that is attributed to your field versus to your personal experience with it right. but uh you have a pretty good uh um utility belt <laughs> Well, thanks. I, I I would hope so. I'm kind of dedicating my career to it, so <laughs> I hope that I'm able to do this. Yeah. Like, what percentage of it would you say is like, like your own experience versus like stuff mm. you opened up a book for? Well, you know what? Oh yeah, I would say maybe it's three things. I think one is just my personality. I feel like that's what attracted me to the field. Um. I think I'm someone who's empathetic and I care about people. But then maybe I, but every, anyways, everything is everything. So yeah. And then myself, I've dealt with anxiety a lot. Um, bum, 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 bum. <laughs> bum, 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 bum. No, bum, but honestly, I think bum. of that song a lot now that I'm doing social work because social work is very different from the psych perspective, which the meaning that I took from psych was a lot more square and and rigid in a way. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's my own rigidity, but all this to say social work is just like, everything's everything, man. Everything's connected to everything. (laughs) Like you can't just look at one thing anyways. So Lauren Hill uh, bumps around in my head quite a bit, but, and it applies to here because I'm like, is it my personality that attracted me to the field? Is it my personality that was shaped by my own anxieties. You know what I mean? Like everything is kind of interconnected. So it turns out that everybody in psych programs is all, hey. all hey. of you. It turns out every Stop it. single one of you. No. <laughs> no. Are there because you're trying to figure your own shit out. Okay. And that is why you're drawn to the field to begin with. I hear that. But I don't feel like that was true for me because I wasn't even conscious of my bullshit. When I chose this degree and I chose this degree super last minute because I'm from Ontario. So I started applying for school in grade 12 and you're there and it's just like, I'll become a teacher. And then you hear bad shit about teaching and I'm like, no, I'll become a nurse. And then my grandma calls me. She's like, not become a nurse. So then I'm like, yeah, what am I going to do? Physiotherapy. I need a master's. I don't want to do that. And then I was like, psych, I'll do psych. (laughs) It seems interesting. I'll see if I like it. So yeah, it it doesn't feel... Like that rings true, but for sure, as things have gone out, a hundred percent. I've heard it. I've heard it. I've heard it elsewhere, and perhaps I think the first time I heard it uh, was shaped by Pat bringing it up back in our school days. Yeah. yeah. So maybe, maybe you know, I was uh, uh, biased in that direction. Everyone says that though, even but, uh, in outside the field. Everyone, yeah, everyone feels that way. So yeah. it's like you're here because you got your own shit, and you want to know why that happened. And then, oh, yeah, by the way, we can also figure out some other people's stuff, too. But to kind of answer your question mm-hmm. about where uh, where does my tool- tools come from, a lot of it does come from experience. And that's what they'll tell you, too. Because even to put into context right now, I'm doing uh, my internship portion of my schooling. And my internship portion is to do this project. And I have to recruit participants. And I'm trying this method with people. Anyway, so I have like my first client. I think I'm going to have a second one this week. Um, but yeah, my teacher, my supervisor is very much like, hey, you're going to learn on the go. Because I'm very, a much more uh, trying to plan kind of person. So I'm like, I'll read about how to create a relationship with people. She's like, girl, no, you're just going to create it. Like you can't read yeah, about this yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what There's I mean? There's no data. Exactly. Yeah, you just yeah, have yeah. to go for it. And I've heard that from so loser. many people. I know. <laughs> I know. I was like, I'll read about the therapeutic alliance. <laughs> Instead of just living it. Um, but uh, but yeah, and then I felt like the the last time I went through this uh, period of time where I did an internship and followed clients, a lot of stuff was stuff that I learned, like going to therapy myself was like tools that I used. Because I don't know, it's, it's almost like the difference between 
reading about what the color blue is and living it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's it's just so different when you've gone through it and you can really like you know kind of what you're suggesting to the person. You yeah. know what it what it means. Unless you're men. Why? <laughs> Cuz then that's the only color you can operate oh. with. <laughs> Because apparently the one immediately to the left and right of that are outside your vision spectrum. But that's another subject matter. <laughs> I feel like I'm completely... It's going over my head. Men's colorblinds. Oh. You didn't oh, know? No, I didn't know. He, did, he can't see... The, he can't, and it's blue too? He, he can't know. No, I, that's why I said outside okay, of the... Okay, okay, okay. He can't distinguish between green and red. Oh. Yeah, which is why we fucking... <laughs> we, we abuse that shit. <laughs> violently every time a video game requires that yeah um and a, and a, and a oh my god poor guy red yeah that's such a big color in games it feels like it is it is and you know like i don't know it might be the difference between a shell that goes straight forward or yes. one that oh tracks god. onto you oh my god <gasps> so wow. do they release games for colorblind people they they release is there like a little patch you can they they release options yeah okay. um huh. some games do wow. it not every game does it but uh there's been a couple games that have had colorblind options on mm -hmm. or in some cases you can design in such a way where it doesn't have to be um outright like for example um uh there's a uh Crossnick Plus which is this puzzle game where you can set the there's it's the the blocks of the puzzle you can just choose what you want the three colors to be. Oh, okay. And then great. there's a lot of different ones to pick from. Yeah. And like if you have any of these colors blurring together for you, you just move until you see one that doesn't. Yeah. You know? Uh, whereas something like Apex Legends, for example, um, is another game where they have they have colorblind options labeled according to the type of colorblindness. Okay. So if you have red green colorblindness, that's one option. And mm. then it has like two or three others for the different like mm -hmm. you know like whatever eye nerfs yeah. <laughs> that, that people uh, uh uh you know might have and 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 it actually does a pretty good job of like uh, um highlighting things in the correct way so okay. that's pretty cool oh interesting yeah but anyway there you go there's your min burn for the random <laughs> for the random episode in a context that has nothing to do with anything but um yeah no uh i i think that like that's that's a a <sighs> like insanely valuable tool set to have and as somebody who um you know has gone most of my life without sort of having any mm -hmm. of this data it's interesting to see like as you just mentioned uh how it's like oh my god what is happening right now right this is this is my body's not listening to me mm. um and then uh you know when you're just like oh yeah here we go there's a lot of known things about this here's one of them here's another mm -hmm. thing this is what it this is what is up, you know, and you're just like, okay, yeah, okay. This is a world that obviously I've not had to pay attention to for such a long time. Mm -hmm. Um and like there are multiple uh effective coping strategies. Yeah. You know, with panic attacks and anxiety. Um and uh some of them, you know, worked out pretty well. Some of them didn't work at all. <laughs> <laughs> if you remember <laughs> Some of them did not work, but um, yeah, that's that's that that stuff is pretty cool when you realize, like, I guess when you realize that um, you can cycle through a bunch of different options, right? Yeah, if the first one doesn't work, yes, and that's super important about finding what's the right fit for you, um, because everyone's so different, and and that's why in research. I'll take a step back. In research, in psych, I sometimes get the feeling that we're trying to find the magic recipe that will work the best for lots of people. Um, and I guess that is, there's a lot of advantages of doing that. But I think it's also worthwhile to put money into smaller ten like trends because not everyone's going to like react well. Like right now, the big thing is CBT. Not everyone's a CBT kind of person. Cock and ball torture? <laughs> Precisely. What are we doing here? Precisely. <laughs> what are we, what are we, what? You didn't know this? This is a very common technique. It's very effective. We're talking about a cognitive behavioral therapy. Should I be worried? <laughs> I'm not down. No, no. We didn't talk about this. 
<laughs> anyway. Rest assured, rest assured. A different CBT. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's good to research lots of different kinds of things because people are going to react differently. And you got to just like try different stuff. And you know what's crazy? You're going to find things that work for you. And if this is like a recurring, persistent problem, then in a year, you're going to have to like do new things because you're going to get kind of tired yeah. of the other stuff and yeah. kind of get habituated to it. So that's like kind of the insidious part. You're like, I got a handle on this. I got my toolkit. One, two, three, four, five. And then after a while, you're like, oh my God, nothing is working. Yeah. Because your <laughs> yeah. fucking, your fucking body is like, like the flu. Yes. It just adapts to yeah. whatever you've got going. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, whatever, whatever part of your brain, uh, 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 it, like, whatever part of your brain, like, fills you with all that like dread is the same and, and like it's it's the lizard it's the lizard it's part lizard right thing. yeah it's the survival part it's the yeah. fight flight or uh, fight or flight part it's the one that's telling you like that's what's crazy your body's telling you danger 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 like like yeah. there's something yeah. around the corner that's yeah. going to eat you but really it's your exams yeah you know no, like it's it's nuts exactly and that part gets to use like the open source <laughs> that is the rest of what you've learned mm. to go like, oh, and those tricks you've learned. Yeah. Fuck those. Yeah. Right. I, we, I already know about those and I'm still <laughs> saying danger, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 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 that feather trick that you learned in Celeste, that ain't going to work anymore. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that's actually a pretty cool thing. Playing Celeste recently, uh, at one point, a character deals with a panic attack and the game teaches you to focus on inhaling and exhaling your breath to imagine yourself balancing a feather That's in, really cool. in air, in the mm -hmm. air, and making it not touch the ground. Yeah. And it's like little visual bits like that, you know, it's, and I was like, oh, this is just square breathing, <laughs> except it's another way of teaching you about like the timing of square breathing, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. which square breathing is, of course, inhale, hold, exhale, hold, right? Yeah. No, that is cool because uh, I feel, at least for me, it's easy for me to just read stuff and it just kind of go through one year and out the other. But having a video game kind of do a visual demonstration, I think that would help you kind of put into practice a little more. Yeah, it actually asks you to pr I picture, input, yeah, the, I input the buttons and, yeah. and do it. You know, it's it's uh, it's like, oh, it's pretty nifty. That's that's that was neat. I like that. Um, do you want to... Uh, perhaps take a letter or two because sure. some people have been writing in and i am you mean in the last how many months yeah, yeah. that's really? what's people have been writing? but that's what's awesome <laughs> right and i and like i i've gotten a lot of uh a lot of positive feedback on just the nature of the show mm. and i've been really happy to hear like you know like what that means to people yeah and uh, some people are getting around to it pretty late. Other people, you know, as soon as it drops. But, like, there's still been uh, mm. emails coming in uh, for the hope that there might be a future episode. Which, guess what? There is. Ding, ding. Uh, that we can, like, talk about some of these things and, and answer some of these questions. At least give our opinions on them. So, uh, thank you if you've been writing in uh, to... Let me, let me get that up there for everybody. Uh, woollycast at gmail.com that's w-o-o-l-i-e-c-a-s-t at gmail.com if you want to ask any questions uh yeah so obviously some of these are gonna you know bounce all over the place but you know, let's roll with it let's roll let's be in the moment let's see what let's we think with it. okay uh let's start with one coming in from that guy that guy says, "Hey, Wooly, I apologize for the long email. Started listening to your to your Figure It Out podcasts. Found them very insightful and helpful. Up until a few months ago, I was in a depressive state of not making any progress on my first book, and it was eating away at me. However, I made a lot of headway on it after removing myself from the computer I game at and just taking my small laptop and typing away on my balcony. Mm -hmm. Since then, I've hit sixty-eight thousand nine hundred and thirty-five yeah. words, seventeen chapters, and I'm feeling really good about <laughs> it." Originally, I tried to do writing sprints on the weekend, but that didn't work out for me. If I found I treat it like a marathon and just write half a page, just write half a page a day, I make much more consistent progress, especially after removing myself from my gaming spot where it's easy to get distracted. 
I have a few people critiquing and going over my work, and I'm surprised at how well it's being received, especially after one of them has been writing for longer than I have. Sure. Uh, and as far as I know, they aren't just going to lie to make you feel better. When I listened to the podcast of Plague, you talked about doing shitty projects, uh, small shitty projects first before moving on to big ones. I can't say I don't have practice. I do uh, D&D style role playing online where it's expected to be literate, descriptive and active in the story. And I've been doing it for over 10 years now. I think that's why it helped me figure out my own writing style. If I had to make a cheesy analogy for it, uh, it's like a small group of fans just going at it, training together for 10 years, challenging each mm -hmm. other to be better, only to find out they've made immense progress together. However, I'm still questioning the quality of my work despite what my friends have said, given it's my first big project. This leads me to my question. Do you think it's possible that you can develop skills unintentionally, and when you start applying it in your own personal way, you're more than prepared, uh, you're more prepared than you realize? Mm. You're asking me? Uh, no, I'm just saying that's, that's, that's the email. That's yeah. The email. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome that this that guy did so much of that progress in that time. It's a ton of progress. Congrats yeah. on that. Because I feel like, well, of course, we don't see all the trials and errors behind the scenes. But from the way uh, they talked about it, it sounds like they just tried a new system and it just fucking worked. Well, uh, getting... So here's the thing, right? 68,000 words is, like, fucking impressive. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't mean they're good. No, no. But what's important is the first thing is... Uh, they remove themselves from the area where they're being distracted yeah. and got a rhythm going for progress, mm -hmm. right? And like we said in a couple earlier, you know, episodes, whether you what you're writing is good or bad, you have if you have if you have fifty thousand bad words that you have to write before you get to your first good word, mm. then you need to start. You need to go through that. Right? If you have to put out a bunch of bad quality stuff before you get to your good stuff in order to learn from all those mistakes, then you have to just start. Um, but getting feedback from people that know what they're doing and are also accomplished and that are, that are encouraging you and you can trust what they're saying and uh, what they say is massively encouraging. Mm -hmm. Um and I know for a fact that there's tons of examples of small pockets of people that just become like insanely talented yeah. uh, by just focusing on like leveling each other up mm. in a way. That's how a lot of bands actually work, right? There's If you have a really good uh, band that just kind of jams and works together and like flows and, you know, you like you, you progress so much further when you're playing uh, an instrument in a jam space mm -hmm. or with a group of people than when you are practicing on your own. I didn't think about that. Yeah. yeah. Like the amount that you have to like, the amount that you're like, when you're just, when you're kind of focusing on your own, you're, you're sort of like, you're, you're, you're almost, it's almost like uh, training hard instead of training smart, hmm. you know, uh, a group of people playing music right away, like all the little things that you need to get used to for the end result. You're just practicing the end result immediately. You're not taking a step of obfuscation by isolating just your instrument and all the tech, all, all the details that and things that could go wrong with that, you you just you have to catch up with all those things right away with other people, you know, and you're all doing it together. Um, similarly, again, to you know, throw it out there uh, in gaming, there's like yeah, pockets of people that are like really good at a particular game in a particular country that you know other people might not know about until like that gets exposed, you mm -hmm. know. Um, uh, you know, Korea got amazing at StarCraft at some point in time uh, years ago and then became known as like, this is this is the country for this game. But we also in fighting games had uh, uh, a player who won Evo in Tekken from Pakistan and they didn't and no one knew there was a, t a Pakistani community. Oh, shit. Right. No one knew there was like talented players just somewhere out there. Yeah. And he came and he won, right? Arslan Ash. And like the thought immediately after that is, who did he practice with <laughs> to get this good? Right. There yeah. must be others, mm -hmm. you know? It's a really cool like uh, 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 starting of a tale in a way where you're just like, yeah, there's a bunch of people that were just in the deep buried and covered of in the fog of war that no one knew about you mm -hmm. know that were just like grinding together and mm -hmm. eventually it turns out they trained past the point that a lot of that other people one. were at yeah. yeah you're right you're at that evil level you yeah. know that's some anime shit <laughs> it is. that's some yeah. full-on anime shit yeah um, no that's nuts i even want to say like 
like even and, and even in that analogy like um something that happens a lot of the time is uh there will be in sports anime there will be a main character who uh will find like they'll just they're just living their normal life but then they meet somebody that shows them the ways mm. of this sport mm. and then it turns out when they try the sport out that they're a natural at it mm. right but why are they a natural well um that one kid that's really good at boxing in Hajime no Ippo, right? He's pretty, he's got a long way to go. But it turns out that working on his parents' dock fishing boat and mm-hmm. carrying all the bait and the boxes and loading up the stuff every morning has gotten him really good with his core muscles. Mm. And he's had a, you know what I mean? He's been working a job that mm-hmm. gave him a lot of the things he needed to do like uh, a well at boxing. Because he's been practicing and he's had that skill from just other things in life, you know. Uh, the other example being like in uh, Initial D, this racing anime. There's a there's a driver who is like super good at like street racing, and like he's able to do super well going down this crazy track on a mountainside, right? But the only reason for that is because uh, his parents have a tofu place. And he has to, like, he has to, t- tofu has to float in the bowl and not, like, touch the sides or otherwise it breaks and gets damaged. So he's used to putting the tofu in the back of the car and driving down this crazy mountain in such a way where he has enough control that the tofu stays intact. Yeah. So look at that. And you, now we can add to the list that guy who's been D&Ding for 10 years. So you already were building up the muscles. Yeah. Without even knowing it. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I'd say there is like, yeah, it's totally possible it exists. And if you have that uh, ad- advantage and absolutely use it because, you know, on your stat sheet, it, it, so to speak, in d d it turns out your writing skill <laughs> was a lot higher than you thought it mm-hmm. was by the time you had to start using it. So uh, why not take advantage of that, you know, uh, if you've been dumping points into writing, mm-hmm. so to speak. But what you want to do, though, of course, is, yeah, I still think it's beneficial to not necessarily write out um, 100,000 words and then uh, not necessarily have it go public. Mm. I think it's still like even though you have friends that are writing that can help you out, I still I still I still think there's a benefit to publish uh, well, not publishing, but like putting out like work that is like ready for consumption by other people, not just your friends and whatnot. And getting their feedback on it mm. because, like, you still have other things you need to learn that others might not have caught. Right. And, you know, if that comes out and it's like, yeah, this was okay or, yeah, this was amazing or, yeah, this was really bad. Like, whatever the case mm. is, you have to go through the entire process, right? So getting yourself through the entire process of finishing a project is still something that you can benefit from. Even if you have a really solid base for writing, right? Um Even if you have been lifting boxes on Mm -hmm. your parents' boat or driving that car, you need to actually go down to the gym, get in the ring, and do a match Mm -hmm. and see what it feels like to get that finished Mm -hmm. before you start training for the long haul, you know? So uh, look at at getting to that step sooner, I'd say. That'd probably be a helpful thing. Mm -hmm. And imagine getting all the way to the end, too. Like you said, you'll get a bigger base for for constructive criticism. Yeah. Here, like, you have your pool... And sometimes we don't realize how, uh, I don't want to say biased because that sounds negative in a way, but uh, when you have a bigger audience, you just have that many more complex perspectives. Well, you have blind spots that you don't know yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And having more people mm-hmm. with more, you know, more eyes on it, are they're going to give you better feedback from things that you definitely wouldn't have caught. Yeah. You know, or in some cases, historical perspective on things that yeah. could make your story more interesting. Yeah. That's my favorite. I that really like nice. that. I just like in the... So in my class, we learned about uh, social constructionism, which is different than social constructivism. Anyways, but all this to say, it's just that trace things back to its history. And it's just crazy to hear how like concepts that are just taken for advantage now actually have maybe political... For granted? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't have an example right now, but but there's just there might be things that you get tormented by that cause you a lot of suffering. But when you take a step back and you see, oh wait, this is actually a political thing. Um, oh, for example, like addiction. Like right now, I'm studying addiction, and when you think about like why aren't there enough 
options. Well, when you look back in history and it's a moral issue and doctors were happy to kind of wash their hands from it and like give to self-help groups, which can be very helpful, but it may like slow down the progress for research mm. and stuff. They're like, oh, okay. Like you don't have to feel so bad for having so few options or whatever the case is. Culturally, like, we've been ignoring this for a while. Yeah. So I find that whole historical or even like for wars and stuff i don't know it's just it's kind of like the wildlings wanting to wage war but they didn't know that they've never won a war against the south quote unquote. right you know and it's just it's crazy how much knowledge we miss because we have such a small lifespan and a narrow a narrow context for certain subjects that have not been thoroughly investigated yeah like i'm even listening to a podcast right now about uh the two other impeachments or nixon and uh clinton's yeah and it's just crazy like it's just giving me so much more context for things that are happening now right and it's just because cra- i i was born i'm born at 90 yeah so like i heard about i knew a bit more about clinton but <laughs> so <if> you... <laughs> you know it's it's yeah the history part is cool so if you're writing a story and like something that you're telling is an actual like it's like turns out there was an event where these exact circumstances mm. or very similar circumstances played out mm-hmm. and you didn't know about yeah. it. There's so much interesting stuff to dive yeah. into before you like commit to the way things have played out. You, you probably know? have so many examples of how a very similar event played out and how all these different people reacted to it and stuff. And you get to draw a lot of inspiration, I imagine, from yeah. all these different You do that research, exactly. Yeah. And you bring that stuff to life. And then, of course, that just makes the story better because now you have a a living breathing event as Mm -hmm. opposed to like uh a means to an end to get your characters from one dot to another Mm -hmm. you know uh hope that helps yeah thanks for writing in uh let's take one here from yoan yoan says hey woolly it's 3 a.m and i can't sleep Got to be up in four hours if I want to have any hope of making it to college on time without skipping breakfast. But at the same time, I'm fully aware that chances are I'll toss and turn until about 5 a.m., pass out without realizing, wake up late, have to skip breakfast despite my best efforts. From there, I'll probably end up feeling too crappy about the morning to feel like eating lunch. And before I know it, I'm trying to make it through the day on an empty stomach and an empty head. Account for the lack of sleep. All the while trying to do my best at being creative from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. working on a short film I need to write for my college course. But what's the point of me saying all that? Well, first of all, for context, um, it's to say that I really, really appreciate uh, you talking about insomnia and panic and discipline and all that and how they might relate to creative endeavors in Willie Will Figure It Out and even in early CSB episodes to an extent. When it's totally not applicable, even when it's totally not applicable to me, it helps to hear someone in a similar situation. Uh, It helps to feel more comfortable with my own and helps me think that even though shit sucks right now, there'll probably be a tomorrow that I'll make it through. um, If Willie can keep trying to figure it out, maybe I can too, Mm. if you will. Thank you. Uh, Well, with all that mushy stuff and so on is nice and I meant I mean, and I mean it the reality is I still have to deal with the sleep deprived state once the sun comes up. So I was wondering if you being someone who. Uh, someone I assume is experienced in this kind of situation had any tips or rules of thumb to follow then uh, when it comes to making it through the day on no sleep, but also with regards to trying to keep working and being creative at the same time. Honestly, I'm just not sure if I have the right email address or if this will get read, but if it does, thanks for hearing me out. And if you can take the energy to reply to, that'll be cool. Thanks. It's just shot in the dark to see what's up. Thanks for your time and keep doing what you do. That is... 100 percent relatable and boy is that not a fucking vicious cycle yeah that one's rough and it's rough because like full disclosure i'm 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 a very morning person and yeah. i'm also a someone that my sleep cycle can very easily adapt and i was raised in a family that's just like what if you're not up by the crack of dawn? You're a piece of shit. What the fuck are you doing? Take control of your life. And then farmer when I, life without being farmers, yeah, basically. So then when I met you and you were in perpetual state of fogginess for literally years that never changed, it was a good wake up call for myself to be like, I think you're you should maybe listen to what people <laughs> in your predicament are saying because it's it's the struggle's real, man. You just. You get by just enough to go to, to, to pass out and then have the next day start the exact same way. Yeah. 
And um Here's I mean honestly like what I if, if I whatever I can think of in terms of like what helps in this type of scenario doesn't help when I apply it to me being in school. Interesting. Because being in school it was just impossible to get that full night's sleep and mm. get the work done. Mm. It was impossible. Yeah, there, you had it rough too. Yeah, like you could not get the work done or get an inferior version of the work done. Mm-hmm. But it it the, the the pieces didn't fit round peg square hole, mm-hmm. you know? Like so it's it's when you're in the middle of the shit and you're in it at school in college working on you know these projects like oh man yeah i i'm struggling to think because it's basically (laughs) it's almost just like yeah the fucked up thing about that is you just have to get past it and then realize that life will not have this continually being thrown at you in this way afterwards Mm -hmm. it'll continue to be like school College fucked up my school, my my sleep schedule. Yeah, forever, right? It permanently changed it for me, um, but it never was as bad as that mm-hmm. after that because I was in control to some degree, so that I could at the very least be like, okay, if I'm if I'm if my life if my my schedule is gearing towards the night, then I can just wake up a little bit later, you know, and and whatnot. But then like your your job has to be able to be compatible with that too, you know. Well, okay, so what I'm hearing is that in school, you're never going to be at 100%. You'll never, yeah, that's what I kind of feel. So let's say... In a demanding project. Let's say this uh, program. This writer, listener, is at 50% right now. When you were at 50%, Willie, what helped you get to like 55? Um, Walking away from it, you know. Walking away from what? Like, even when I know that it's like, I have to get this done mm-hmm. and uh, 9 a.m. is my class, mm-hmm. I want to get at least three hours b- of a nap. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to do anything. Mm-hmm. So, I have to be lying down by like 5.45 okay. to hopefully see if I can pass out by 6. Yeah. To wake up and get get there for 9, mm-hmm. right? Um. There's times when you're like, I need every second spent touching this project. Mm. But like, um, it would help to like do like a burn, like, like try to get like a bunch of shit done on it and then get up and literal and physically like remove myself from it. Mm -hmm. Especially if I've been working on it every day. You know what I mean? Like, like. Even when you don't think you can and should take breaks, you still do have to take breaks. Right. Um, you suffer so much more when you don't, I yeah. guess. I 100% agree because uh, I got to touch a bit of that struggle this uh, stint in school because my last stint was just basically multiple choice test answers and many essay question answers. But I never had to pace myself and write essays and deliver something and sometimes stop myself from delivering something that I thought could be better, Yeah, you know? So I imagine it, there might be a correlation with the art thing. And what helped me was doing this uh, 50 minutes of working and 10 minutes of a break. And it feels very indulgent to take 10 minute breaks every hour. But in the end, I felt like I was much more productive and felt better about everything. So I imagine that's kind of what you mean, like knowing when to take breaks and knowing when, okay, I'm going to read. I'm going to hand it something that's not what I wanted it to be, but this is good enough and I need to sleep. Yeah. If, I mean, if you, if you have enough, if you, if you've tr- you can try literally with two different projects mm. to not take breaks mm-hmm. and see, you know what I mean? Right, and see right, the result. Experiment. Yeah. You can experiment with it and go like, Oh, you know, you'll probably see the results we're saying. Like you'll probably see things are worse in the situation where you, you don't take those, you know, I would also uh, put that hand in hand with like, it's not at all it's not always possible, right? Mm-hmm. It doesn't always apply. But there are times when I was able to spend more time in the lab um or in the in the uh studio with other people working on their projects, you know, and 
sometimes that's a, it's a tricky thing because sometimes that's a productive environment. Sometimes uh, it slacks mm. depending on who you're around and what they're up to and how much they're going to distract you. But if you are in a productive one, that shit works good too because you're getting stuff done but like you're not feeling as drained by it because like mm. the productive environment is kind of like yeah. helping you get through it with a lot with other people that you know are going through it as Yo, well. A hundred percent. Like what I was doing this summer. Okay. So basically the structure of my program is that I had a theoretical part where I took classes and then there's a the practical part and the practical part, I have to write a paper about 30 pages to be like, I know what I'm doing. Basically, please accept me. Um, so that part is so isolating. And you're not in class anymore and you're just working from home. And I remember the first get together with my school friends. Everyone's like, wait, you're also going through the same thing too? <laughs> you're also like crying every day and ripping your hair out and think this is awful. And it was just nuts to think how we all just thought, oh, no, you're the only one going through this. You're not good enough. You need to try harder. Why isn't this going faster? Um, and all this to say, when I was there, they told me about this cafe where it's for people who are doing like a, like theses and whatever and are writing and they have to go through blitz of writing. And the 50 minutes on, 10 minutes off is where I took that from because everyone's in this cafe. You have to reserve for four hours. So it motivates you to come and show up and do it because you pay money to like use the facility and drink their coffee and whatever. And everyone is working for 50 minutes. So all around you, everyone's fucking productive and you don't want to be the one person on your phone or like not working dick it off yeah exactly but then during the 10 minutes everyone's on break at the same time and there's a lovely little area out front where people can stretch and chill and talk and exchange and you know you already kind of have a point in common because everyone's in school so it's just very easy to exchange and support each other and it has made the world of a difference for me in terms of like my mental health yeah, it's it's literally uh, it's it's the benefits of removing yourself from your home environment of distractions. Kind of like that guy leaving from his uh, gaming area. Combined with surrounding yourself with other people that are also progressing. Yeah. Combined with a mandatory break schedule. Yeah. So it's like you're just firing on all cylinders with those three key things to getting mm -hmm. through the struggle. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, that doesn't apply to six a.m. grinds. Of you course. Know? And it doesn't work for every particular type of. Uh, uh, project exactly but if and when it is applicable right each and uh every opportunity you can get to like put yourself in that type of space mm -hmm. to get work done mm -hmm. would make a little bit of a difference but again overall it's a crappy situation yeah you know yeah i think it's important to just focus on like if you, you put yourself on a scale of one to ten in terms of how things are forget the ten but how can you get to the ne that next peg up like, what's the smallest? Because that's how you make progress is just those little steps. So that's what I would recommend to uh, to the to the writer. You're not going to stop the bleeding, <laughs> right? <laughs> but you can certainly, like, apply pressure and spit and suck and, you know, and <laughs> do what you can. Spit on your wounds? No, no. Spit the blood out. Oh, okay. And suck the, you know. Yeah, the venom out. Yeah, yeah. and do what you can. Uh, actually, well, not the venom. I mean, I heard that's actually... I heard... I don't know if that's real or not, but I heard that if you if you do that, um, you you might accelerate. Yeah, the, the, I don't know. The I heard the same thing. Poison. Like you might you... just have to amputate. We live in Canada. Yeah, it's not a big concern for me. No, <laughs> that that sentence is applicable to many things. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I hope that uh, gives some perspective. Mm. But it is just going to be a shit show mm. until you graduate. Mm. I feel like the most intense programs are not reasonable with no. what they ask of you. And if you are especially like, you know, passionate and putting everything you have into all your projects that you're being asked, all your homework that you're being asked to do, then like you just won't have the time there. It just doesn't exist. So no. you're, 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 you know, you're, you're picking the less of two evils basically, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but yeah, that's that's kind of, I guess, something. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Hey, Wooly. Uh, this is basically just a long overdue thanks for the recommendation on Dan Carlin's Hardcore History. Ah, well, oh, I love him. Yeah. 
a couple years back on the Friendcast. I've never been too interested in history outside of uh, previous academic requirements, but after a glowing recommendation for the Wrath of the Cons, uh, my interest was piqued. Sometime after, while looking for podcasts to kill some time, I decided to give his Blueprint for Armageddon series mm-hmm. a try. Um, and I was instantly hooked. The way he was able to dig into the personal stories of large-scale conflicts uh, made for a very emotionally engaging tale, more than most fiction. I read even. And at multiple points, I was even brought to tears by the extremes of both the horrors and wonders that were recollected. Needless to say, after finishing the series, I did not hesitate at all to purchase the entire back catalog and sated myself for the next few months. After that, I started branching out into other history podcasts as well, uh, such as History of Rome and uh, Martyr Maid, and would like to... Uh, would like to back you your recommendations with another history podcast you might enjoy uh, from history on fire. Uh, Given your love of boxing, I thought you might be interested in the story of Jack Johnson, who became the first African American world heavyweight boxing champion during the height of racial segregation. Um, Not to spoil too much, but he was pretty much the definition of swag, not giving a fuck. Uh, We're doing that could be very dangerous to someone of his persuasion. Anyway, I hope you give it a chance if you're ever in the mood. Cheers. Thank you, Zed. Uh, I totally know about that um hunter gave me a dvd of unforgivable blackness <laughs> which i do need to uh, go through which is the jack johnson story and i've heard oh, much about him over the years uh one of my favorite stories about him was uh he got pulled over uh by a cop for speeding and he was given a hundred dollar ticket and he whipped out two hundred dollars and he paid it off right away and the cop said this is this is it was only a hundred dollars he's yeah. like yeah but i'm going back home the same speed <laughs> <laughs> so here's 200 you what know that like that level and this yeah. is like fucking what back in that day in yeah. the days of like oh uh, like you know the in the days of sun i don't think you know what you're doing right mm-hmm, now mm-hmm. you know like that's yeah that's a fun one i, I definitely want to go into um you've gone through a ton of dan carlin yeah well because the thing is uh i i I hated history when i was younger is that what it was because i remember it a little differently well what do you remember i remember when we first started dating and you were like at we i'd ask i'd make reference to things that happened in the past and you were like what is that? But that's what I mean, because I hated it. Okay. So I didn't pay attention. Okay, okay, so okay. So I knew jack shit. Basically, the Ontario curriculum that I went through was you had history up until grade 8, and it was like Canadian history, and then in grade 10, you had world history. Yeah. So grade 8, pff, I didn't pay attention at that p- period, and Canadian history I find kind of boring. But you passed it. <laughs> well, you know. You, regurg- you, know you regurgitated what the yeah, tests. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then grade 10, oh my God, my teacher was a fucking joke. We played Risk for a week because we convinced her that it was like related to history. That's godlike. Legit. That's a soup. That is a, that is a respectable hustle. <laughs> so, so needless to say, when they offered grade 11 as an optional, I flew right past it. And then, God. yeah, when we started dating, I you realized, need, oh shit, I okay. need to up my game. But like, we need, you need like an extra... You need an extra, like, set of uh, points on the report card for the friend group that (laughs) swagged their way into playing Risk for History and actually talking the teacher into it. (laughs) Because that's that's entrepreneurship, you know what I mean? <laughs> that's cunning. That's thinking outside the box. You know what we're talking about? Transferable skills? Yes. That's exactly what was being uh, put to the table there. You know, that is honor roll hustle points. <laughs> Show your fucking parents that, right? <laughs> hustle points on the report card, right? Like, that is, that is baller. That is okay. baller. This teacher was so dense that my friend copied the homework of another friend friend who's not well liked by the teacher copied the homework of the friend who was well liked by the teacher and like the friend who was well liked was like yeah let's do this and let's see if she grades this differently she graded them differently that's insane <laughs> fucking yeah, got an a for the one and a c for the other not even the meme where it's like hey let me copy your homework okay but change it a little bit let's just let's do a test let's straight up see and she's gonna she, catch this and she just graded them differently yeah yeah amazing yeah. Yeah. Well, there you have it, folks. If you ever wanted to know, 
if favoritism <laughs> was quantifiable, go fuck yourself. We should publish uh, those results. Yeah, that's funny because I that because that started as a story of like, oh, these shitty students, what are you doing? And then it's like, nah, but look at the results though. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Terrible. No, exactly. But all this to say, um, yeah, I realized that I wanted to learn more about stuff because now it seemed genuinely more interesting as I got older. And what got me into it was um, this YouTube series called Crash Course, and they do a bunch of different like lessons and they have a world history one which i really enjoyed because they have cute little doodles and it's little 10 minute digestible things that lets you just kind of see what you're interested in and yeah oh, so so you went from not knowing about history to knowing about history and just magically there was like you just kind of had the inception of the idea somewhere yeah, like no one ever talked to me about history. I just like was like, you know what? I should just it learn just, about it this. It just popped up. And yeah. I just thought I really want to better myself. I want to uh, be, you know, I want to self-actualize. I think I need history to do that. That is admirable. Thank you. That's Thank very, you. very. This fucking liar. <laughs> this fucking, this lie hole right here. <laughs> that is your mouth. <laughs> Is 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 ignoring the part where I was like, hey, you know when uh, you don't remember your history stuff? Uh, what you probably should do should be to look up some podcasts and YouTube videos to catch you back up to speed because... That never happened. There's some really good stuff out there that is probably more compelling than your history classes Wait, ever Wait, you actually were. told me to do that? Yes. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. <laughs> that part i remember you schooling me about history i remember we talked about but then and how bad I after was. multiple sessions of like uh, after multiple discussions where whatever we were talking about got sidetracked for like okay in history this happened mm -hmm. at this time and this is what was we had to, what? Like, take breaks in our conversation yeah just, like, after doing up. that i think somewhere around the fourth or fifth time i was like you know i, I, I know because you said you said and you're like man i should really like I wish I could go take like an adult history class or something like that. Huh. And then we got it. And then we talked about it. And I was like, you probably could, but that's not what you want to do while you're working a job and mm -hmm. like actually, you know, doing things with your life. But I was like, what you probably could do instead of taking a class would be listen to a podcast or find a, a, a good YouTube channel. Cause I'm sure there's stuff out there that goes into it because we know there's channels that do that for like science. Mm. And I know that there's podcasts out there that go into all kinds of topics. So I was like, yeah, like I work on YouTube. There's lots of great things on YouTube. You probably could find something that would wow. be exactly what you're looking for. Nothing. Zero recollection. Nothing, huh? And that, ladies and gentlemen, is selective memory. You just keep the stuff you want to keep. <laughs> you just toss out the rest. Well, but thank I, you, Willie. Willie turned me on to Crash Course. But I toss you out. <laughs> and then to Dan Carlin. Dan Carlin's the man. He's pretty good. Yeah, he's good. Um, we went through most of that, actually, driving through New Zealand. We did. And it was like, you know, full day trips in the car. We drove every single day while we were there. Every single day. Every single day was a road for trip. For multiple hours. Yeah. But like that podcast was fucking amazing the entire time. Yeah. And... um. And that's just one of the many series. So, like, it's like, yeah, super big, super big advocate for hardcore history and mm -hmm. pushing that as, like, if you're interested, you know, which you happen to have a blind spot on. <laughs> and now you've got some pretty good up-to-date, you know, yeah. shit. And, and now there's shit I don't know about. There you go. I, I can't tell you much about Watergate. <laughs> you know? So, um... I can practically write a book now. Amazing. After eight episodes, I'm a, I'm a scholar uh yeah cool right on i'm glad you enjoyed that i feel like uh i feel like i, I like every time i want to get around to that that unforgivable blackness dvd i mm -hmm. have to like look around for a dvd player yeah <laughs> i guess the ps4 still plays dvds does it it okay. should because well, there you go yeah well my laptop is on its last legs but uh You're, before you we still get have rid of one, it right my yeah. laptop's don't have cd players and my tower doesn't have one either damn yeah I mean, towers don't have them anymore. we just moved past it uh yeah we yeah. just moved past like it's it's a it's a physical storage medium that's inferior and no longer necessary mm -hmm. so you know get with the times bruh 
Yeah, I know. Okay. Well, anyway, I, I mean, I'm, I'm feeling all right about that. I think we answered some questions. I think we shot the shit a little bit. We did uh, our thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, um, damn it, I was really hoping to remember the word for that thing we talked about earlier. Oh, huh. And it's bugging me, so I'm only going to get a chance to look it up after I fucking hit the stop button, so that's worthless. Um, but, yeah. I don't Can know. You, like seamlessly edit us saying the word back in our conversation. Is that how editing works? You think I'm going to fucking edit this? <laughs> I'm going to export this shit and upload it. What do you think? That, have you listened to a single previous episode? You know I don't. You know I don't give a shit about anything you do. You really don't. She really doesn't. <laughs> she really, really doesn't. It's kind of wild how little of a shit you give about everything I do, which is all and it, which, you know, is works well when it works well. Yeah. It wor- it's good. It's good when it's good. But holy fuck, <laughs> do you not give a single shit about anything surrounding anything I do right now? Uh, you know, I just I'm not a I'm like a normie. And talk a lot about like non normy things. Uh, you know. Let's just let's call it there. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.